Thank you. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, at Zeppelin, we build technology and provide services to help protect smart contract development. Uh, we're mostly well known for our security audits, but we also have some products and we maintain the open Zeppelin repo of smart contracts. So this talk will be divided first. I'm going to review last year since DEF CON 2 in terms of how the smart contract ecosystem evolved. I'm then going to focus on some new techniques and patterns we've seen arising in the industry that I, I'd like to give more visibility to. And finally, I'm going to talk about some pending challenges in smart contract security and hint into some possible solutions we're working on. So let's start with history, the dark ages. So 2016 was a pretty dark year for smart contract security. <laughs> uh, we've seen some pretty embarrassing hacks in the space. Most of you probably don't remember many of these. Uh, except for the DAO. But just to get a sense of how the industry was at that moment, I want to focus on one of them specifically, which is Rubixi. So Rubixi was um, a formalization in a smart contract of a pyramid scheme. The original name was Dynamic Pyramid, but uh, apparently the developer didn't think this was a good name for marketing reasons. So he renamed it to Rubixi, which is much cooler, but he forgot to rename the constructor, and this made... <laughs> This made it uh, turn into a public function because that's how Solidity works. So anyone could call the dynamic pyramid function and become the owner, <laughs> thus gaining, gaining the ownership of the contract and being able to steal the, the fees from the contract. So this seems like a dumb mistake, but this same feature uh, from Solidity probably caused the parity wallet hack, which happened recently, and cost like uh, 30 million to be lost to hackers. Um, so. Um, in, in, in May 2016, uh, Peter Vesenes wrote a great article calling the community to gather around uh, building best practices for smart contract development. And one month later, the DAO hack occurred. The contract held roughly 15% of all Ether tokens in existence, and $50 million were lost. And at that time, the only solution at the moment was uh, to hard fork the protocol, so Ethereum had to hard fork which in turn brought a lot of complications and security problems. So it, it was not a good outcome in the end. Um, so at that moment, the, the, the community was pretty aware that we needed to ramp up our security practices. And three months later on September, we launched Open Zeppelin as a community effort to gather around auditing contracts, creating better security practices, and actually gather some smart contracts code to, to share. Uh, a week later, I was in Shanghai for DevCon 2, and everyone loved the idea. Many projects wanted to gather around Open Zeppelin and help build these this contracts. And since then, the project has been growing quite a lot. Uh, for the past three months, we had more than 8% uh, weekly growth, which is the hockey stick figure every <laughs> Silicon Valley entrepreneur wants. But the truth is, we, we built something that everyone was uh, wanting, and the industry grew a lot say, since then, so um, it grew with the industry. Um, apart from the community uh, building better tools for smart contract development, Ethereum as a platform evolved a lot too. Uh, we've seen the consolidation of the various standards, like the ERC20 uh, proposal that turned into EIP20 for token standard. Uh, also, the platform fixed some security problems like the nasty cold stack attack that was possible before, and after EIP 150, it's no longer possible. Um, also, Solidity, the, the most popular smart contract language, got some cool new features in terms of security. The payable keyword that allows to set uh, when a contract can or cannot receive money, require and assert that are really useful for setting the preconditions and postconditions of our functions. A transfer, which is a safer way to send money from our contract. Uh, revert, to cancel execution of, of a function uh, without wasting all the gas. And pure and view, which are the evolution of the constant keyword and allow to specify uh, if, a contract, if a function can or cannot read or write state from the contract. Uh, we've also seen the death of <laughs> Serpent as a language. After an audit we did, uh, which in which we found eight pretty serious vulnerabilities, which led us to find a critical vulnerability in the rep token, which allowed any attacker to freeze the contract forever uh, and made, made them 
have to mi migrate the rep token to Solidity. Uh, the the le Serpent language was deprecated after this tweet from Vitalik. Uh, and now all the all the efforts around an, an alternative language are focused on Viper, which is a Serpent successor, and it's pretty cool. So you should check it out. It's not production ready yet, but uh, I hope it gets more attention. Uh, and more recently, with the Byzantium hard fork, some uh, consequences on on security are the addition of big integer modular exponentiation, which allows uh, RSA signature verifications. We'll see what people come up to with this new tool. The addition of the static call opcode, which enables safer calls to untrusted contracts because it makes them not able to modify your storage. Um, and the addition of opcodes for data handling and revert, the revert opcode, allow for much easier and tighter ways of implementing upgradability proxies, which is uh, uh, an ongoing discussion topic in, in smart contract security. So that's what happened, and uh, now I want to focus on some new techniques and patterns we've been seeing on our audits and, and work with Open Settlement. Um, oh, can you see that? Okay. Let's say you're uh, a developer learning Solidity, so you create your own ERC20 token for fun. You, by using Open Settlement, you can do this pretty easily with like 10 lines of code. So you think you want to add something extra to make your token cooler. Um, just for fun, you think you want your token to have an extra functionality of being able to lock funds for a certain amount of time, and you want to add as little extra code as possible. So a way to do this is to add a lock function, a public lock function that instantly transfers the tokens, but then stores when those tokens should be released, and then modifying the standard transfer functions to make them honor this new extra re restriction on that. So let's see how this would look on code. Um, we add this, I don't know if you can see this, but you add this uh, new log function, which basically calls the standard transfer function, and then adds uh, in, a, in an array of logs for each address uh, when those funds should be released. And then what we need to add to that is uh, overriding the standard transfer functions, uh, adding this extra restriction where, which uh, via this can transfer modifier, which checks the amount of transferable tokens at a certain point in time and enables or, or disables the transfers. And then to implement this uh, transferable token amount, what we do is we iterate over the array of logs for every ad for, for that address and we add up the amount of locked tokens and we, we return the total balance minus the locked tokens. So in this way, apparently we added a cool new feature to our token and it seems great, but it actually is that's a big problem. Did anyone, can anyone tell me what the problem is? Good, good. You want a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have a case of a gassy array, as we like to call it. The problem with this array is that the length of it uh, is controlled by anyone that can call the log function, which is in, in this case is public. So you, you need to see the length of the array as a user input. And as you know, in security, you need to sanitize inputs. And any, anyone can call the log function and create lots of logs in the array of, of someone they want to mess with. And the array, if in this case, I tried it, and if you add like 5,000 logs to an, uh, to an address, the gas cost of calling a transfer uh, for that token is so high that it doesn't fit in a block. So the point here is, um, sorry. Uh, by adding an extra feature, we actually introduce a security vulnerability. <coughs> so th there's a simple fix for this, which is adding a, an upper bound to the amount of logs for every address. But I wanted to, th to make you think about a different approach to adding features to a token, which solves this problem in particular, and I think is better for security uh, conceptually. The, so the idea is to leave the token as is, don't add any extra functionality, and actually implement the, the, the locking functionality as an external contract. So when a user wants to lock tokens for another, they instantiate one of these new token time block contracts, which receive the beneficiary address and the release time, and then transfers the, the tokens manually from the, from the normal token contract. And now if, in this case, the, the, the previous vulnerability with the GASI array was solved, but if there were one vulnerability in this new contract, only the users uh, using this extra feature would be affected. 
Uh, whereas with the previous version, any vulnerability potentially could affect normal users that didn't want to use the lock function. Um, so this is one of the patterns we've seen uh, in terms of improving security in new function design. And the point is, when you're thinking about adding new features to your contracts, really think about the security implications. Not always having more features is better because you increase the attack surface. And for another example on, on, of how this is being implemented in the industry, at the beginning of the year, most crowd sales were implemented as part of the token code. And now, most, to most crowd sales are implemented as a separate module. So it, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense to have all the crowd sale code in the token forever for just two weeks or two minutes of crowd sale. Um, Finally, this, I, wa I want to talk about some, the relation between basic security, software engineering practices and smart contract security. Uh, th these are very simple stuff, but they are not being applied in, in our industry, and I think this is basic stuff we should be doing. Um, so first is clear and simple code is always better for security. Most security problems come from a, a difference between the programmer's intention and what the code actually does. So having clearer code makes it easier to check the programmer's intention and that the, the code actually does what he wants. A corollary of this is that naming matters. I've seen really, really bad naming in many contracts. So please take your time and think about naming because it helps increase the security of your code. Reuse existing audited code. There's plenty of good libraries out there you can reuse. There, you can't imagine how many times we re-audited the same re-implementations of ERC-20 standard tokens. Um, also, don't copy-paste code, because if the code you're using is updated, you're, you don't get the updates. And also, don't repeat yourself. Um, that's also a, a source of bugs. And finally, and most importantly, uh, write tests. That's the best way to check that your assumptions about the code are correct. And also, if you change the code after the fact, you can prevent regression errors. So, so as I was saying, all these are Basic security, uh, I mean, software engineering practices that every developer should be doing. But in our case, our code manages real money. So we need to protect it from ninja hackers, stupid users, and other developers in our team. Uh, so I want to talk briefly about the relation between security and trust reduction. Let's say you're a freelance Solidity developer and your client requests a capped crowd sale. So you, you write this simple contract. But then he comes and says, oh, wait, don't forget. We need to create tokens for the foundation, too, when the crowd sale finishes. So you go, sure, boss. You, add, uh, you make your crowd sale ownable, so it has an owner, and a privileged function to mint the foundation's tokens once the cap is reached. So only if the cap is reached will it mint tokens. But then your client comes back and says, oh wait, but make it trustless. I don't want to be the owner. Uh, so you remove the privilege function, put it into the buy tokens function, so that the last investor, when the cap is reached, means the token for the foundation. This is better, right? It's more trustless. But wait, now an investor can come after the cap is reached, and with this particular code, if the message value equals to zero, they can continue calling these buy tokens, getting zero extra tokens, but re-minting tokens for the foundation, ruining the crowd sale. The point here is it's not always good to leave critical, vulnerability, uh, critical functionality of your contract in the hands of the public. It's sometimes OK, it's actually sometimes totally OK to leave really critical stuff from your smart contract in the hands of an owner, especially if the if the investors or, or users of the contract are already trusting the owner in some other way, like giving them money. Um, so I wanted to say that. So I want, I want to end with some open problems that we see in the industry and some ideas we're working on to solve them. <coughs> so I briefly touched upon some of these, but one of them is upgradability, or both in terms of how to upgrade a smart contract once it has been deployed to the network, uh, for like bug fixing or adding extra features, interoperability, it, that is contracts calling uh, them each other, the gas costs of how contracts interact within each other, and code duplication in the blockchain. So we recently announced uh, our Zeppelin OS project, which tackles these four problems. 
And I'm going to tell you how we do that, or how we plan to do that. Uh, so for code duplication, basically what we're going to do is turning open separately in the library into an on-chain uh, library where applications can direct, directly connect and link contracts to the on-chain version to reduce the, the payload that needs, the bytecode that needs to be uploaded to contracts on-chain and all the, all the tokens that are reusing open Zeppelin's standard token implementation, they can share the same code on-chain and reduce the gas costs of deployment and reduce the, the amount of storage needed. Um, and this kernel will also have an upgradability mechanism uh, via uh, the, the delegate proxy pattern uh, so that we can do uh, upgrades to this kernel of really core and important modules uh, for, from the ecosystem. So if we find a bug or, or we need to improve some of the code from, from those core libraries, we can do so and possibly fix a production code from smart contracts. And of course, this, this, needs, a, this needs a governance mechanism because uh, nobody would use some, something that is in the hands of a few developers which upgrades uh, are, are approved. Um, and by the way, we, we did this, the technical research for this, uh, we did it uh, with the Aragon guys, and they've been using the same idea on Aragon OS, so you might want to check that out too. And two, two other big components of the OS are the scheduler and the marketplace. Uh, so the scheduler solves the gas, the gas problem of smart contract interaction, and it comes from the idea that when two contracts interact, if you think about who pays for the gas price for those interactions, for example, a typical example nowadays is a multi-seed contract controlling a crowd sale contract, some privilege function, for example, um, finalizing the crowd sale. If you think about it, the first, let's say you have a three of five multi-seed, the, fir the first owner proposes to make the call, the second one signs it off, and when the third one signs it off, the actual operation is executed, and all the gas cost of executed that is paid by the third or the last um, owner of the multisig. So with the scheduler, uh, we're building tools to enable contracts to request asynchronous operations in the future. So a multisig could gather all the signatures and then request someone else to do the actual execution of the operation. So that we the couple who pays for gas and who is actually approving the calls. Um, uh, and this same mechanism also allows for asynchronous programming in general, not just uh, this, this thing, this thing is gas, but enables um, sm smart contracts to to request uh, operations in the future. And for the marketplace, we are standardizing the way contracts interact with each other. So um, we think that there's a bigger potential for smart contracts when they start interacting more, and we see a, an ecosystem of of contracts interacting. And we're standardizing the way a, a contract can expose its services in terms of I, this contract offer this API call for a monthly payment or a one-time fee and you get access to everything or a per call fee. And finally, part of, also part of Zeppelin OS is a set of off-chain tools which we call the smart contract SDK which are basically CLI tools and web applications to manage uh, easy, more easily your contracts. Um, so you can know, know more about this. It's a completely open source project. We encourage everyone to participate in, by giving ideas and code, uh, and we can talk about more about this later. Finally, we yesterday we launched a Solidity Capture the Flag contest. We're giving away 10K in prices. It's a hacking contest. Like There's a couple of contracts you need to hack to advance to the next level, so if you want to check it out, uh, it's it's fun, <laughs> uh, and that is all. Thank you very much. <laughs>